I've been a, a software developer for uh, seven years, and in the past four years, I've been working on a distributed system that employs an event-driven architectural styles. Uh, during this, uh, these four years, we have implemented dozens of long-running processes. So that's why in this session, I would like to share with you some tips on designing and implementing long-running processes. So let's have a look at the agenda. First, we'll discuss a, a bit about the context, why I think this topic is important now. Then we'll see what are long-running processes. After that, we'll see the two main integration architectural styles for modeling long-running processes. These are choreography and orchestration. And then we'll delve into some lower-level patterns of where to actually store the state of a long-running process. At the end of the presentation, we'll see some patterns for handling failure, uh, because we don't want our process to stop halfway through and our system to be in an inconsistent state. So uh, how many of you are working on a distributed system? OK. Yeah, I think most of us are working on distributed systems. Uh, all the projects that I've worked on have been distributed. And most of us are implementing long-running processes. And of course, we'd like these processes to be fast, to be reliable, to be decoupled, to be, to, should, they shouldn't have any bottlenecks, should be easy to understand, easy to implement, easy to change. But of course, having all that is impossible. So that's why I think it's important to have the right tool for the job. And basically, in this presentation, I would like to share some, some of the tools that we use to implement long-running processes so that you're better, uh, better prepared. And another reason for holding this presentation is uh, the fact that many of the sessions on microservices talk about remote RPC, remote procedure call integration style, by using HTTP. Um, in this session, we'll, we'll share some message-based uh, patterns for, for building reliable systems. But what actually are long-running processes? Well, uh, we'll first start with what is a process. A process is just a set of instructions that are executed as a result of a trigger. So in this case, we have the uh, place order message. And a long-running process is just a special kind of process whose execution lifetime exceeds that of a single process. So basically, we have uh, multiple triggers that need to be hand handled by the same process instance. So in this case, when we get the place order message, we save the order ID and total value and request a timeout. When we get the timeout, we will uh, hydrate the same process instance, read the data that, that we saved, the order ID and total value, and publish an event. So that's basically it. Uh, long running means that the same process instance handles uh, multiple message, uh, message, messages. And long running doesn't mean long in the sense of time, at least not, not for people. We can have long running processes that are done in milliseconds. And also, it doesn't mean that it will actually process most of the time. Um, it will actually wait for the next trigger uh, uh, most of the time. So let's see some, uh, some examples. And we'll start with the order fulfillment process. This is what happens between the time that you push the checkout button and the order is shipped to you. In order to do this, a business, uh, multiple departments in the business need to collaborate. Uh, sales needs to approve the order, finance needs to charge the customer, inventory needs to pack the order, and shipping needs to actually ship the order. So in order to achieve this enterprise process, multiple services or bounded contexts need, need to collaborate. Another example is a business policy that's internal to a single service. So uh, there's this, this thing, it's called buyer's remorse, that says that people feel sorry after making a purchase. That's why most of the cancellations uh, happen within a two-hour time frame after purchasing something. And of course, cancellations cost the business money. Uh, they need to refund the uh, customer's credit card, they need to unpack the order or even cancel the shipment. So instead of taking the, this cost, may, maybe it's a better idea to, when you get the order to just wait for two hours. And after these two hours, when you get the buyer's remorse timeout, uh, only then start the, the long running process or then start the order fulfillment process. So basically, again, we see a pr process with two triggers. And the third uh, example is an IT process that handles integration, and probably you, you've dealt with this. So when we, finance will, will get the order placed event, we will need to charge the customer's credit card. So we will send a charge credit card request to a credit card processor that will talk with a third party, like Stripe. After we get the response, we will uh, uh, send the response back to finance, the charge credit card response, and uh, we will publish the order charge event. So basically, another long-running process with two triggers. Hopefully now we know what are long-running processes, but how can we model them? Uh, and in order to do this, uh, let's take a requirement, and this is the order fulfillment process that we've just discussed. Um, I actually have some code. Um, 
I won't show too much of it right now, but if you'd like to see more, you can join me at the .NET booth in, uh, during the networking or the, during the breaks. Cool, so the first option of implementing this is using choreography. Choreography basically means that the decision making is distributed. When something important happens in a service, so for example in the, in the blue service, it will publish an event. Other services can subscribe to, to those events and make decisions based on them. So as you can see, there is no central component in here. The decision making happens in each service. Uh, and let's see how we would implement our order fulfillment process using choreography. Well, the place order command will, would come through sales. Sales will approve the order and then publish an order placed event. Finance and inventory will both subscribe to that event and finance will charge the customer. After that, it will publish an order charged event and inventory will pack the order and after that, they will, uh, will publish the order packed event. Shipping is subscribed to both these events and after uh, getting both, it will try to ship the order and publish an order shipped event. And that's basically it. Uh, let's, uh, let's have a look at the trade-offs that we made by, by choosing this approach. Well, the, one of the main benefits is that the components in this, uh, in this architecture are loosely coupled. Services only couple to the event definition, which should be pretty lightweight. So this is uh, why they are loosely coupled. And this brings a benefit that it's easy to extend the flow. If the business comes and say, okay, we actually want to activate some promotions for some, some of the orders, it's easy to do. We can just uh, have the promotion service subscribe to the order placed event and do its magic. And this actually has another benefit in the sense that the components in, in this architectural style are temporarily decoupled. Uh, this means if the promotion service is down, this failure will not cascade through the entire system. So we can actually fulfill the order even if the promotion service is down. And when the promotion service uh, comes back up, it will have a queue of messages to, to process and will start uh, catching up and activating the, the promotions. Now on the drawback, uh, usually choreography-based solutions are harder to monitor because if you want to know what's the state of an order, you actually have to look in all the four services. Um, of course, there, there are other ways around that, but that's the topic of another discussion. But I think that the main disadvantage is that choreography-based approaches um, allow a single process. And what do I mean by that? If the business now comes and say, okay, but actually for some customer segment, I want to charge the customer only after the order is shipped. Now, uh, shipping needs to listen to the order charged event and finance needs to li listen to the order shipped event. And for other customers, I want to, um, I want to charge the order only after it is packed. So now finance also needs to subscribe to the order packed event. And this actually introduces uh, a lot of coupling and implementing this requirement, which is quite simple. We'll, uh, we'll, for, for doing this, we'll need to change uh, finance, inventory, and shipping. So this, basic, this basically does not comply with the open-close principle, right? Because we need to add a lot of accidental complexity just because we, we need to make a, a small change in the business requirement. So some tips, how do we use choreography? Well, uh, we use choreography when the process is stable. Uh, so, as I said, when you don't have multiple flows of uh, multiple flavors of the same long-running process, and since um, the boundaries between the services are more stable, we use choreography as the preferred approach between uh, between services. And uh, doing doing it this way, our services are uh, loosely coupled. Uh, we also use events to break an enterprise flow in subflows, like we just saw. We use the order placed, order charge, order packed, and order shipped event to break the entire order fulfillment flow in subflows in each uh, in each of the services. What's important, and we, we've learned this uh, on our own, is to don't use events when you really have request response. So if after publishing the order placed event, you are waiting for an order placed process successfully from finance event, that's not actually eventing, that's request response. Uh, don't use choreography when it increases coupling, like we saw uh, for handling multiple flows. So what, are, what is the other approach? And of course, this is orchestration, which, which is centralized decision making. Now we have a new component, the orchestrator, that will actually orchestrate all the other services and tell them what to do. So to, to implement our flow, we have the four services, but we now also have a new order service, which will act as the orchestrator. This is the service that will handle the place order command, 
Then we'll go to sales to approve the order. It will go to finance to charge the customer. It will go to uh, inventory to pack the order. And it will then uh, go to shipping to actually uh, finish and ship the order. Okay. But what are the uh, strengths and weaknesses of this approach? Well, uh, one of the main benefits is that the long-running process in this approach is easier to understand, which makes it also easier to change because it's in a single place. It's in the order process, right? Uh, this also means that it's e easier to monitor. If you want to know the state of a long-running process, we just need to look in the uh, order service. And it allows many processes. If instead of going through sales, finance, inventory, and shipping, for some customers, we want to go to sales, inventory, finance, and shipping, we just need to uh, update the, the order service, and that's it. The other services won't, won't need to change. So this is a great benefit. Now on the drawbacks, the order service is tightly coupled to the other services, to sales, finance, inventory, and shipping. And also, if one of the other services is down, then the order service cannot complete. So in these solutions, there is some temporary coupling between the, between the components. Um, that's not that bad, but we must ensure that the orchestrator do does not become a god service, in the sense that we, uh, we add all the business behavior in the order service, and all the other services are just CRUD services without, uh, uh, so they, they still need to be autonomous. And of course, since uh, we have a central component in our architecture, this order service can become a performance bottleneck be because it will handle a lot of messages. So we need to, to ensure that this does not happen. So some tips. Uh, use when orchestration when the, ch when the process changes often because it's easier to change. Uh, use orchestration inside service boundaries. Coupling is more okay inside service boundaries or bounded context boundaries than outside of them. Use orchestration when integrating with third-party systems. So basically, we put a gateway in front of uh, every third-party th that we use. And when we send a, a request to the gateway, and the gateway then handles the orchestration and talks with the third-party, for example, credit card processor or a, a shipping API. And I think that the most important tip is to don't centralize all orchestration inside the single service. Orchestration shouldn't be a, a service, and what I mean by that is that we shouldn't have uh, the order service tell shipping to ship with fun courier. We should just tell them, okay, please ship the order, and shipping should still know how to ship, so it should still have business behavior. The, the shipping policy should be in the shipping service, not in the order service. So basically, th this says, this says do not use a big workflow engine that orchestrates everything. Services should, should still keep their autonomy. OK, so now we saw how to model them, but where to actually store the state? And this is important because long running, as I said, means stateful. Uh, and now we'll, we'll delve into different parts of the solution and see how to use different patterns. And um, we'll describe three different patterns of storing the state. The first is to store the state in the domain entity. This is basically the, the most well-known approach uh, that we use. And we have a requirement to uh, integrate with the credit card processor in the charge to charge the customer. So when we get the order placed event, finance needs to send the charge credit card request. In order to do that, when we get the order placed event, in the order placed handler, we send the charge credit card request. After that, we save the order in the database with its status pending. Okay? And then we wait for a response. When we get a response, we get the order from the database, update its status to either paid or payment failed, and uh, publish the order charged event. And let's have a, a quick look at the code. The code uses uh, nservice bus, which is a .NET uh, framework, but I, hopefully it's uh, easy to understand for anyone. So basically, when we get the order placed event, we will create a new order set its status to pending, and then save it to the database, and send the charge credit card request. In, when we get the, the charge credit card response back, we get the orders from, uh, by its ID from the database, updates to update its status to either paid or payment failed, save the order in the database, and uh, if, the, if the order has been paid, publish the order charged event. Okay. Uh, what are the pros and cons of this approach? Well, the main benefit is that it's simple. You don't need any new library code or frameworks to do that, so it's quite simple. 
but it does break the single responsibility principle. Because now in the same class, you have both process logic for uh, getting the status of the order and who knows uh, what, but we also have business logic, like canceling the order or applying discounts or stuff like that. Another drawback is that it encourages batch jobs. So um, if the business now comes and said, OK, but we actually would like to cancel uh, pending orders that are older than 30 minutes, how would you implement that? And I think most of us will create a batch job that queries the, the database every two minutes for, all, for orders, pending orders older than 30 minutes and cancel them. And I don't really like uh, batch jobs because they uh, contain business logic that should be in the domain entity, not in the batch job. And uh, another drawback is that, uh, that we need to be mindful is that simple processes don't usually stay simple. And in our case, we actually want to validate the credit card charge before charging the customer. So now a two-step process became a three-step process. So usually these kind of uh, pro flows uh, tend to become more complex. So tips only use when the process has a couple of steps, three steps uh, at most. Another approach that we can use is to store the state in the, in the message. And let's, as we said, we want to validate the, uh, the customer's credit card. And in the organization, uh, let's say that we have three different validation. One that's free, one that's an expensive credit card validation, and a very expensive fraud detection algorithm. And we want to use the, we always want to use the free credit card validator because that's free. For orders, uh, for orders that uh, are, uh, have a total amount larger than 500 lei, we also want to use the expensive credit card validator. And if an order is, uh, uh, its total amount is larger than 2000 lei, we first want to use the free credit card validator, then the expensive credit, credit card validator, and then the very expensive fraud detection. So basically, we want to route the same message based on a, uh, through a set of validation steps based on the order uh, uh, on the order total. And there's a pattern for this in the Enterprise Integration Patterns book. It's called the routing slip. So what we do, we attach a routing slip to each message that describes the uh, processing steps that we need to go. So in this case, it's A and C. And then we route the message, and we wrap each of our components uh, with a special message router that knows how to read the routing slip and route the message to the next component. So basically, when it goes to A, it reads the routing slip. OK, A is done, so it routes to the next component, which is C. In our, sol in our solution, what we did is when we get the order placed event in the order placed handler, we look at the order total, and let's say we have a 500, uh, 700 lay order. So we know we need to route it to the free credit card validator, the expensive credit card validator, and then we route it back to finance in order to get the results. Okay. Let's, uh, let's have a look at the code. So when we get the order placed message, we still create the order. We set the status to validate and, and save it. But we also create a new validate credit card charge command where we pass the total value, and then we get the routing slip. The routing slip is just a list of strings, or the destinations of this message. We always add the free credit card validator. If the order amount is larger than 500 lei, we also have the expensive credit card validator. If it's larger than 2000 lei, we also add a very expensive fraud detection, and we add the results host, which is the finance endpoint. When we, let's have a look at the code for the, for example, for the free credit card validator. Uh, what it does, it validates the, the credit card charge. And if it's not valid, then it, we will need to, to get the routing slip, add an attachment. This is basically just an error message that we put on the message and route the message to the last step to the results host. If the message is valid, we don't do anything in here. And actually, the uh, routing slip library takes care of routing the message to the, to the next item in the destinations list. And this is the, uh, in the finance endpoint, the results host, where we get the, the message. And now we need to, to see if it's a valid uh, or not. So how do we do that? We get the routing slip. We see if we, if we have any attachments. Basically, if we have attachments, that means that the validation failed. So in this case, we state its status to validation failed. If not, we set its status to pending and, and send the charge credit card request like we saw in the previous uh, version. Cool, so what are the pros and cons? Uh, basically, 
one of the main benefits of this approach is that it is a performance solution because it doesn't have any bottlenecks. It's also easy to change. If you want to change the, the amounts that we use, we only need to change the order placed handler. If we also want to add a fourth validation type, we can just uh, change the order placed handler and add a new validation because the processing units, the valid validators in our case, are not coupled to each other. So this makes it easy to extend the flow. Drawback. Uh, this solution is harder to monitor and debug because you actually have the state of the process in the message. So if you want to know the validation status of a given order, you actually have to find the message and look at, it, uh, at, at its contents, at, at its uh, headers, which makes it harder. To... Some tips, only use this when the process uh, steps can be determined upfront for each message and are, and are sequential. This basically implies that we cannot use routing slips if uh, we need to uh, based uh, if we need to, to choose our next step based on intermediate results. Okay? For that, we have a new, uh, a new pattern, another pattern, which is uh, called the process manager. And in this case, we store the state of the process uh, in a process specific process instance. And now let's look at shipping. And let's say we have a shipping policy that says, please first attempt to ship with Fun Courier. If we cannot ship with Fun Courier, then attempt to ship with Virgin Cargos. If we attempted to ship with Fun Courier but didn't get a response in the agreed SLA, then cancel the Fun Courier shipment and attempt to ship with Fujian Cargos. If you cannot ship with Fujian Cargos or didn't get a response in the agreed SLA from Fujian Cargos, please notify the IT department so they can deal with it uh, outside of the system with a manual workaround. So there's a, a pattern for, the, for this. It's called the process manager pattern. And um, what it does is basically it puts a, a central processing unit, a process manager in the middle that knows that, that keeps the state of the process, and it will decide what to do next ba based on its state. So basically, this is a hub and spoke integration style because after each processing unit does its job, it will reply back to the process manager, which will decide what to do next. In our case, uh, this is the process manager, and I, I'll actually, I think it's easier to have a look at the code to understand what it does. So this uses the unservice bus saga construct, and this is the state of the long-running process, which is, in this case is the order ID and the uh, status. When, when it, uh, this process uh, receives the ship order message, it will save the order ID and the status to shipping with Fun Courier. It will send a ship with Fun Courier request and request a timeout to check if we did not receive a response from Fun Courier. When we get a response back from Fun Courier, we check. Uh, did Fun Courier ship the message? No. Then attempt to ship with Virgin Cargos. In this case, we set the status to shipping with Virgin Cargos. We send a, a ship with Virgin Cargos request and um, raise a timeout to check if we did not receive a response from Virgin Cargos. If Fun Courier could ship our command, which, uh, and the status is still shipping with Fun Courier, so we didn't get other messages in the meantime, we publish the order shipped event and mark the process manager as complete, which, which will basically delete the process instance. When we get a response back from Ujjar Kangus and, and Ujjar Kangus could ship our command, then we publish the order shipped event and mark, uh, mark this process as, as complete. If not, we, we just throw a cannot ship order exception so we can notify the IT department that something uh, went wrong. When you get a response back from uh, uh, the timeout from Fun Courier, so we didn't receive a response from Fun Courier, and the status is sti still shipping with Fun Courier, what we do is we first cancel the Fun Courier shipment and then attempt to ship with Virgin Cargos. If we get a timeout from uh, from sh ship from um, from Ujjar Kangus, we don't do anything. We just throw an exception and let uh, let the people handle it. So, uh, what are the benefits and drawbacks? Well, the main benefit is that it can handle complex cases. As you can see, when this simple case it tends to get uh, pretty complex, and the process manager is a pattern that can handle that complexity without introducing too much accidental complexity. It's also easy to understand and change because the shipping policy is there in the ship process uh, order manager. And it also encapsulates all the data and behavior. So as, as you could see, we also have timeouts, so we don't need batch jobs. We can uh, put that logic in the process manager. Of course, the drawback is that uh, we, ne we need to ensure that this doesn't become a God class that contains all the business behavior. And since we have a central processing unit, th th this also can become a performance bottleneck. 
So some tips, use this when the process changes based on intermediate results. Uh, use this when the process is complex or needs uh, to execute multiple steps in parallel. Rotting slips cannot execute multiple steps in parallel. Uh, and use this when the process changes often because uh, it's easier to change if it's in a single place. So now we saw how to, where to store the state in either domain entity, in a process instance, or in, uh, in the message. So, but how to actually handle failure? And I think handling failure is important because if a long-running process stops halfway, we don't want our system to be in an inconsistent state. And we can do it the easy way or the hard way. So let's see how we can do it the easy way. Well, what happens if we send a ship with fun career request to the fun career gateway? This calls the fun career HTTP API, but we get an HTTP timeout. So, so what can we do in this case? The simplest answer is that we can retry. We can just call it again. What happens if it still fails? Well, we can wait 10 seconds and then retry again. If it still fails, wait 20 seconds and then retry it again. This is what's called delayed retry or exponential backoff. And basically by having this retry policy, we make sure that if, if this message fails, it's not a transient error. So it's not a deadlock in the database that would be solved by a retry. But we must, uh, we must be careful when we're using retries because what happens if uh, although the Fun Courier HTTP API uh, we received the timeout when calling it, they actually processed our command. We don't want when you do our retry to send a new shipment. So this is why it's important for the Fun Courier Gateway to be an either potent receiver. This means that if it handles the same message once or five times, it will always have the same result, just one single order shipment. But we did all that, and unfortunately Fun Courier are, is down. So what can we do? Like we discussed, we can when we send a ship with fun career request, we can raise a timeout within uh, 30 minutes. And when we get that timeout back after 30 minutes, we can take some mitigating actions. So in our case, as I said, we'd like to ship with urgent cargos. In order to do that, we cancel the fun courier uh, shipment. And this is what's called a compensating transaction because this will undo the effects of the ship with fun courier request. After canceling, we will uh, send a ship with urgent cargos request to the urgent cargos gateway. But let's say that unfortunately they can't ship uh, our order either. So what can we do then? And I think this is important. Maybe we don't need to automate everything, every edge case. So in this case, a simple solution would be to put that message, which cannot be processed in a dead letter channel. Basically, this is an error queue and have people uh, monitor, actively monitor this uh, dead letter queue and do something. So. If someone from IT sees a message uh, in the error queue and it sees that, okay, it's a cannot ship order exception, they can call Bob from shipping and say, okay, Bob, please go ship that. And Bob can use uh, another shipment provider or just can uh, ride his bike and ship the order by himself. But in some cases, uh, these patterns are not enough. And now the business says that, okay, we actually have high volume orders. And this is a special kind of order that cannot be shipped in a single shipment. We need to split it in multiple batches. But if you cannot ship a batch, please don't ship the order at all. And there's actually a pattern for this. It's a failure management pattern. It's called a saga. And instead of having one big transaction to ship the three, the, the three batches, we split it in, into multiple smaller transactions. But since these aren't isolated, we need to make sure that we can compensate each of these transactions. So how does this work? If we get uh, the first transaction, this executes successfully. But when we, get to, when we run the second transaction, this one fails. Now we need to compensate. So, so we execute C2, and then we execute C1. In our example, we have a ship high volume order command that comes in the ship high volume order saga. This will look at the command and say, okay, we actually need to send three batches. So it will send three ship with fun courier requests. Fun courier will say, okay, first batch shipped, second batch shipped. No, nope, sorry, I cannot ship your third batch. So at this point, we need to compensate. In order to do that, we, th we send the three cancel sh fun courier shipment commands. Um, what are the benefits of this approach? Well, um, you can use this approach if you don't want to use distributed locks or two phase commits. And uh, this makes this approach more performant because you don't have um, uh, a single point of failure, the, the distribute transaction coordinator. And it's also more performant because of this. And uh, although it's not ACID, this approach can, uh, can be ACD, so it can be atomic, consistent, and durable, which is, which is good. 
but the lack of isolation can cause anomalies. So if between T1 and T2 you get a T4, you need to decide what to do. And handling these cases are, and all the different orders that messages can win can introduce complexity. So this is a pattern that I basically have at the bottom of my toolbox. We haven't used it in production code yet. Uh, we managed to handle failure using the other easier patterns, but it is a good pattern to know. So in, uh, in conclusion, uh, what I want to, for you to get out of this is to know the tools, uh, know when to use orchestration and when to use uh, choreography, know when to store uh, the state of the long-running process in an entity or in, a route in, in the message or in a specific process instance. And when you have failures, know how to solve them by e e either using retries and delayed retries, using either potent receivers, using timeouts, using compensating transactions, have a dead letter channel where, which contains only poison messages, and then have manual business workarounds for handling all these errors, and use sagas if you really have to. So basically, none of these patterns is, is better than the other. They just have situations where, where they're better or not, and um, use them wisely. If you want to see the code and look through the, through, through the different patterns and more, again, find me at the .NET booth. Uh, you can also see the code on my GitHub account, which is here. Also, I will uh, probably blog about this subject in the next month. So that's on simpleorientedarchitecture.com. If you want to know, find more about long-running processes, I highly recommend the Integration Pattern and Enterprise Integration Patterns book by Bobby Wolf and Gregor Hope. Um, also, they have an accompanying website which contains all the patterns. Also, Bernd Rucker is the co-founder of Kamunda, which is a workflow engine. Um, has some really interesting uh, blogs and presentations about long-run running process, which I highly recommend. And if and Service Bus has great documentation, so you can uh, look over there. And if you want to find more about, about sagas, the pattern description on microservices.io is very good. Also, there's a uh, 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 there's an example with implemented Saga by using routing slips in the second link, and Katie McCarthy has a great, um, uh, great video on it. Okay, so thank you. Now, if you have any questions. Uh, we will pick some questions uh, based on your votes. Uh, if we don't have time to go through all of them, yeah, please uh, go ask Victor in, uh, during the break. So, Victor, a question from Ciprian. Uh, do you have any tips for building and scaling long-running processes with cloud functions, serverless? Um, no, not not really. But um, basically, if, if you're looking at scale, then probably a choreography-based approach would be better for you because you can uh, have all the requests go in a queue and then have different subscribers get messages and do work. So it, it's easier to parallelize work with, uh, with a choreography-based approach. Um, but again, we do have some, some colleagues that use Azure functions, and you can find them at the .NET booth. I personally haven't used them. Thank you. Uh, how, do you run, how do you test effectively long-running processes that wait for other long-running processes? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. And um, we, it's very important for the framework that you use to be easy to, uh, to, to unit test the, 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 the process. So we do that. In order to test uh, the integration of long-running processes, we, we use two different approaches. One is to actually host the long-running process, the components, in memory and test it in memory. And the other is to actually test the integration. But this uh, tends to be more complex because it's an unsynchronous system. And also, we need to be um, uh, careful with the time. So basically, in our solution, we have time travel, which sets that, uh, OK, we only run billing once a month, so maybe we want to time travel to that day of the month. But this is, of course, is bespoke code that needs to be implemented. Again, if you want to, um, we can talk, uh, talk more about that at the, uh, the dot, dot .NET booth. Uh, when you store the state in the message, how do you handle concurrent processing of messages? Uh, what if message B is processed before message A? Uh, with the routing slip pattern, that can, cannot actually happen because when you get the message, a component so when you get, the, for example, the order placed event, uh, you look at the message and then you put the routing slips on that message, on the validate credit card charge, okay? And then you route it to the first component. And the first component will actually route it to the, to the second component. So you cannot get um, concurrency issues. You can get multiple messages 
before actually attaching the routing slip, but that's not an issue. Again, that's that's perfectly fine because they will have different. They, they will actually be different long-running process instances. We'll pick up another one. Great presentation. In the Saga pattern, what if C commands fail? Wouldn't be possible to send intention for the shipping first, then send the confirmation. Yeah, well, uh, that's a that's a good approach, but of course that depends on the what does the um, provider offer. So, what if the fun career provider doesn't uh, doesn't offer that? And actually, this is the problem with with sagas. We need to make sure that uh, in, in this case, of course, we just said cancel fun career shipment, but probably maybe maybe that's not possible. So, we need to make sure that the compensating transaction cannot fail. So they. They just cannot fail. <laughs> it's it's. I know it's hard to understand, but yeah, it's. Uh... I see a lot of DDD influences. Is that a requirement? Um, it's not a requirement, but actually, long-running processes and sagas are uh, very well known in the DDD community, because DDD says that um, an aggregate should should just uh, do one transaction, and if you have another aggregate that needs to do something, you publish an event. And that aggregate will handle that event and do something. So basically, now we have a long-running process. So that's why these patterns are um, well known in the DDD community, but it's definitely not a requirement. And last one: uh, Is this using Windows Azure or something else? Is every service a worker in this case? Yes. So um, in, by using a service bus, we basically abstract the transport. We can use uh, anything. Um, so you can use a service bus and, and deploy everything on premise with Windows services and use MSMQ as a transport or RabbitMQ as a transport, or you can deploy the endpoints in the cloud using uh, worker roles or web jobs and have the Azure service bus as the transport between them. Basically, this is transport independent. You you can use wh whichever. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you.